He didn't understand. I read them, I understood them, and I condemned them, wrote the idiotic Emperor Julian, having perused from such a lofty height our really rather clever Homeric psalms made by Apollinaris Bishop, Christian. Thus the imperial pagans oh so feeble attempt to put us down. Immediately we scribbled back. You may have read, but you did not comprehend. Had you comprehended, you could hardly have condemned. That put him in his place straight away. Kimon's Story After the death of my cousin Marilus, a poetical friend made this epitaph. The poem speaks in the voice of the deceased, and as I read it, I can hear again the slow, measured speech of my clever cousin with something of the viper's hiss and slither. My endings at the crest and apogee, I exit on a surging, seething wave. Homoteles is my inseparable friend, my loving one companion. These last days, although he seems unworried, I can sense his grief. I see tear-reddened eyes he seeks to hide. While I pretend to sleep, he sits a quietly sobbing sentinel by the bed. I feel his loving gaze upon me always. We are of similar age, both twenty-three. Fate might have horrendous things in store, some worse than death. Should I live, Hermoteles so easily could turn cold, change his affections, leaving me bereft. Dying now, I possess unending love. The author of this moving versicle knew I was related to the deceased. What he did not know and could not know, was that Marilos and I, inseparable, had grown up together like twin brothers. I am devastated by this cruel poem. Marilos in death escapes my malice, even though he took Hermoteles from me. Should Hermoteles attempt to repossess my heavily ransomed, widowed, orphaned heart. Marilos' grinning spectre would interpose, as if I could hear him singing from the grave with something of the viper's hiss and slither. Are you happy now, sweet cousin Kimon? 
Are you happy? Now he's yours again, the beautiful Hermoteles. Now you have no excuse to slander me more. Spartans King Cleomenes of Sparta watched his mother Cratis clear wearily. How could he say it? How approach the subject? Ptolemy of Egypt had agreed to help the Spartans against the Achaean League. As guarantee, Cleomenes should send his regal mother and his royal children across the sea to Alexandria, pampered hostages to the Egyptian cause. The old lady knew a thing or three. Utterly unfazed, she smiled at him, at his stammered explanation. Don't you worry. I'll go with the children willingly. I'm only glad at my age I can serve my country still, our splendid Sparta. Humiliated? Me? Oh, don't be wet. We outdate the house of Lagos by an age. These Ptolemies are newbies, born yesterday. I come from an ancient Spartan line and hardly care what Greek Egyptians think. Lagids, riffraff, Ptolemaic scum. 1909-1911 His father, a poor seaman from one of the remoter Aegean islands, he worked for a blacksmith, was shabbily dressed, cast off remnants of other people's clothes, strong broad hands filthy from constant labour. Through interstices of torn shirt and trousers came magical glimpses of rounded, muscled thews and warm brown, moulded cavities of flesh. After work, the fancy often took him to dress himself in something especially flattering to adorn his well-set frame. A fine, expensive tie for Sunday wear, he liked to parade on Sunday, a new shirt of unusual cut and colour, to pay for which he'd sell to a passing stranger for a small sum, his rich, athletic body. In the long story of Alexandrian history, crammed as it is with coruscating beauty, never before was found such a fabulous creature. Now he's gone, forgotten, except by me. Dare I now admit it, tasted sensually upon my teeth and tongue, no one ever photographed or drew the exotic outline of his body, face, or thew. In time, his loveliness faded, puffy and worn, from unremitting toil and indecency. Like any old piece of metal, he was thrown into the smithy, heated, hammered, beaten, shaped or cast into a handy and appropriate tool. His strength and beauty gone, tossed and lost 
among scrap metal clanging.